obvious reason I really enjoy saying that. And I'm glad that as many of you as did remember that the clocks changed. <laughs> kind to people who turn up in an hour's time. <laughs> it's my joy to be here. Um, I'd like to ask, not that I can see, but if there are any uh, new visitors with us today. Up, oh, marvellous. Good to see you. Good to see you. You are very welcome. And after service, um, actually very briefly today, because we have a congregational forum, uh, we have refreshments down at the other end, uh, and you are very, very welcome in indeed. Now I have some announcements to make, I hope, <coughs> if I can find them. <laughs> now you see, because Deacon Jim is away in Philadelphia today yeah. with Kathy, nobody has put rings round the announcements I'm supposed to read out. <laughs> Well, I suppose you should probably know that in about 20 minutes after the end of service, we have a uh, open forum uh, whereby you get to ask me pertinent questions <laughs> about my uh, ministry and aims and all the rest of it. Um, and I hope that you will be kind and compassionate in there. Um, Oh yes, another thing that's important is on Wednesdays, now many of you already know this, but on Wednesday evenings during Lent, um, we have an opportunity to come for uh, the service of Vespers, or evening prayer. Uh, it's a place of peace, and a place of contemplation, and a degree of quietness where we can come and have prayer. And afterwards, there is a soup supper. Now as I say this every week, I don't want to bribe you with a soup, but I have to say, the soup last week was really good. Yeah. There was a vegetarian chili there, which defied all expectations. Anyway, I had most of it. Um, so please do come along. Now last week, our total giving was $2,817. That includes money for the building fund. But a sizable wallop of that was for the general fund. So I have to thank you very much for heeding uh, the message that I gave there about the need for the stuff in the general fund. I would say it's still a couple of hundred dollars under what our weekly needs are, but it is uh, hugely reassuring. And thank you very much for your continued um, stewardship and generosity. So now, let us turn our minds and our hearts. Oh, oh wait a minute. <laughs> oh, for the luncheon. Yeah. Oh yes, where is that? In the other end. Um, for the deacons' Easter luncheon, I say the deacons because if I keep saying that, then hopefully the responsibility for it will lie upon the deacons. <laughs> <laughs> After our Easter service on Easter Sunday, uh, it has been traditional to have a nice lunch um, provided by the deacons with volunteers. Now here's where the volunteers come in. Um, so that we don't continually burden the hospitality team, there is a sign-up sheet down at the end, uh, which Deacon Noah will direct you to if so needed, uh, to help uh, with wanting to bring in dishes and that style of thing. Well, preferably things off the dishes. Yes. Just <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> In case you don't know me, I'm Jay. I bake dog biscuits for my dogs. Don't eat And <laughs> I'm going to be baking them to sell for the Deacon's Fund. Uh, Ted has agreed to put some in his shop. I use all natural ingredients, and they're made from a human recipe, so if you're hungry, you can eat them. Oh, oh there you go. <laughs> Three different kinds of samples here today, So, um, and I'm working on nutrition and Okay. I'm very glad you mentioned that because on the table out there is a whole new batch of soap. Uh, <laughs> and because of the proceeds of the previous sales, uh, I've been able to get my oils in bulk. Um, so the price per bar is now five bucks. Uh, and it is all handmade, batch made. Now, the, the, the one I particularly like is the um, lemongrass and ginger which has got ground juniper berries in it, so it's a good exfoliant. That's a really good one. Uh, of course, they're all good. 
Right. There's a peppermint and bergamot as well. <coughs> and what else is out there? Well, they're just going to go and have a look, won't you? Yeah. Um, so the lovely Ken Barons will be, uh, where are you, Ken? Oh, there you go. Will be personing that uh, table after church for that 20 minutes or so. Um, and as I say, five bucks a throw, 15 bucks for four. Um, so please do go and support the Deacon's Fund, because we're looking for over and above ways of supporting the Deacon's Fund so that it's not being drawn out of the, um, uh, the, the general fund. Mm -hmm. Explain this, so, because I must have missed something. This is something that you are making yourself at home? Absolutely, I make it from scratch myself at home. Yes. Oh, you just don't Using nothing but organic natural ingredients. <laughs> I would right? not have guessed you were the crafty person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm very crafty. <laughs> and give ourselves over to prayer. Almighty, ever-living and ever-loving God, we come here today in faith. We arrive here in faith. We arrive here as your beloved children who come to bask in your presence and come to grow deeper in love for one another. We pray that you will anoint our spirits today, that our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our souls may be open to your word. Prosper our worship, Almighty God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
opportunity to do a confession and absolution. I keep thinking, God, what am I to say? And it's, I want to come up with something different all the time, yet it's almost the same. Because with all of us, it's different what confession means to us. I know I never had the opportunity for confession or absolution when I was growing up in my Lutheran church. <laughs> and I really didn't when I became a practicing Christian in my little charismatic group. It was just, it's between you and God. It is between you and God. Everything that's happening within your life, God knows about it. Good, bad, or indifferent, you think nobody notices, God notices. And God is paying attention to us. Paying attention to you. Paying attention to me. And I, in my age now, is really, I'm really trying to, I'm getting a better grasp of what a confession is. And I'm realizing it's a good thing. It's a good thing because what it does is it cleanses me. When we finally just stop and we pray to God, even if it's just staying on our feet, driving in our car, getting on our knees, it's not one certain way that we have to confess to God. As long as we talk to God and say, I cannot take this. I need your help. I am just screwing it up. I don't understand. Things are going well. Whatever it is within your life, God knows it and understands us. And I think we all understand that. But on Sunday morning, it's even a special treat because we get to do a special coming to God and handing over to God what's ever weighing heavy on our hearts and minds. Whatever that is that's trying to drive that wedge that I always talk about, a wedge between you and God, a wedge is pie shape. It starts out small and then it makes it bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden you think there's this great, great chasm between you and God. But we just don't see that doggone bridge that God has built. There is a way to come back. And it is up to us, each one of us, to go to God and talk to God and confess whatever it is that's on your heart and mind. Let's take that opportunity now to go to God and to take that bridge to God. God, I thank you so much for that opportunity, this wonderful opportunity you always give us to come back to you when we forget that all we have to do is just turn around and you are there. Hold on to our hand, God. Help us through these times. Take these problems, whatever they may be, from us and help us to be able to work through them. They just won't disappear, but you'll help us by showing us the way to complete ourselves and to take these problems and work on them, thus taking them away. God, be with us. Hold on to us as you always do. And just thank you. Thank you for your presence in our life. Amen. Amen. there may be 
or has been, is now absolved in the name of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's from Joshua, the fifth chapter, the ninth through the twelfth verses. The Most High said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land. And the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thank you, God. Our responsive reading this morning is from Psalm 32, verses 1 through the end. Happy the ones whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Happy the ones who the Lord imputes no guilt. And in the spirit there is no power. For I held my tongue, my tongue wasted away through my groaning all the day. Your hand was heavy upon me the day and the night. My moisture was dried up like a drought in the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the liars, and you forgave me. Therefore, let all the faithful make their prayers to you in time of trouble. In the great water flood, it shall not reach them. You are a place to me to hide in. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Glory be to the Creator, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. The second reading for today is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. We are not alone. We are not alone.
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, reading Luke 15, verses 1 to 3, and verses 11b to 32. <clears throat> now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told, him, uh, told them this parable. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in destitute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to feed to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. And he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. And I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
speak your holy scripture, and that we all may hear your words and not just mine. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Scripture didn't end when the Bible was published. God didn't finish speaking when the last books of the Bible were put together a couple of hundred years after Christ was resurrected. We have extraordinary, visionary prophets of God who have lived all throughout that intervening time. So I have another scripture like to read you. And thus in our creation, God Almighty is our natural Father, and God all wisdom is our natural Mother, with the love and goodness of the Holy Spirit. These are all one God, one Lord. In the knitting and joining, he is our real true spouse, and we are his loved wife and his fair maiden. And again, a mother can give her child milk to suck, but our precious mother, Jesus, can feed us with himself. He does so most courteously and most tenderly, tenderly with a blessed sacrament, which is the gracious food of true life. With all the sweet sacraments, he sustained us most mercifully and graciously. That is what he meant in these blessed words where he said, I am that which Holy Church preaches and teaches you. That is to say, all the health and life of the sacraments, all the virtue and grace of my word, all the goodness that is ordained for you in Holy Church, that I am. And Jesus, our precious mother, suckling us, God, our mother, nurturing us, the strongest Christian tradition going back, not just to the Bible, but beyond, and coming forward into the great thinkers of the church. This motherhood and fatherhood of Christ and this motherhood and fatherhood of God is something that we still find challenging in 2013. Yes. That to me is kind of shocking that it wasn't particularly challenging 800 years ago when Mother Julian of Norwich wrote those sainted words. But in 2013 it's still challenging today. Well today is Mothering Sunday and Outside of the U.S., it's Mother's Day. Um, and it's important to bring to mind Mothering Sunday because Mother's Day isn't the invention of Hallmark cards. <laughs> Amen. Now, I'll be honest with you, Father's Day is the invention of Hallmark cards. <laughs> but Mother's Day is a reflection of Mothering <coughs> Sunday where motherhood is lifted up and exalted within Holy Mother Church. Now, I've thought deep and hard about this over the last week, and I've thought about my own mother, obviously, that's a simple thing to do, and I've tried to recognize within the earliest part of the relationship with my own mother where my understanding of God actually came from. And I realized that my understanding of God probably came from the nurture and tenderness that I received from my mother. My mother was the means of grace, not just the origin but the means. I felt, looking back, that I was receiving grace from my mother. Her tenderness was like the prodigal, uh, the story of the prodigal son, absolutely without condition. Motherhood being like that. I threw up on her. She loved me. I needed my nappies changing. Diapers. She loved me. I threw my food across the room. She loved me. These are the characteristics of motherhood as we lift it up in our minds and in our souls. They're also the characteristics of God as we understand them and experience them in our lives. So the fact that God our mother is still a difficult thing to deal with in 2013 suggests that there must be some other underlying reason why we're uncomfortable about it. Because we know deep in our hearts that the motherhood of God is an excellent simile, an excellent description for the relationship between God and ourselves. We are nourished and suckled by that same God. In Jesus Christ, our mother, 
we are supple. Well, I then went back and thought about my own mother. Extraordinary woman, very intelligent, um, suffered under a burden most of her life because she had no uh, higher education. She had no higher education because when she was brought up, there was only one expectation of what a woman should do. And that expectation was, well, you find somebody to marry you, and that's that, pretty much. You have kids, and you had a good life, or you find a good life according to how good a marriage you make. <coughs> you know, even in 1950s England, that was the status quo. Mm -hmm. And because that was what was expected, and my mother had been told all her life that that was what was expected, that's what she got. And she was just insanely lucky that she found a man who wanted to nurture her and wanted to allow her to develop and grow and spread her wings. But it could have been very different because it was very different from my aunt. And because my aunt didn't find a good marriage like my mother did, the entire course of her life is absolutely, completely unrecognizable from each other. As I've said before, my mother speaks rather like I do, you know? <laughs> now, Auntie Dorothy speaks a bit more like that. <laughs> and when I got old enough to work out that they were sisters, I thought, oh, how did that happen? I went to my mother and I said, how come Auntie Dorothy speaks like that? She said, well, it must be the company she kept. Mother said, <laughs> <laughs> actually, you look back, it was all down to those relationship choices. It was all down to marriage. <clears throat> so many women's lives were just panned out by the decisions of some man. And the man was as much trapped as the woman, because my brother-in-law, ex-brother-in-law, I can say this because this is a long time back, was uh, a, point in, uh, a point of faith here. You know, this is what I think about when I think about that trap being a burden on women and a burden on the men who think it's to their advantage, or were brought up to believe it was to their advantage. Because he was brought up to believe that any sort of touching or closeness or embrace with his children was in somehow puffy, sissy, not the sort of thing he could do. So it robbed him of the childhood of his two children. It robbed him of fathering his two children. Because of the same lunatic nonsense that trapped my mother in a belief that she was inadequate because she didn't go on to higher education and she didn't have a career of herself until much later in life. Even today, she's appeared on TV series numerous times with my father. She's written her own book on learning to paint. She is lauded and approved of by so many people and she still believes herself to be an adequate. She as a mother was too adequate. She was an extraordinary mother. I didn't want to go anywhere else. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to do any of these things because being at home with my mother was as good as it got. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid in a stroller, she would take me through the woods in St. John's in Woking, near where we lived, and point out to me everything that was going on. And I sat there, filled with wonder, like the first man born on earth, looking at this extraordinary creation which my mother showed to me. Without my mother's eye for such things, and her passion and joy in those things, I wouldn't be a fraction of what I am. I don't know what I'd be. It's inconceivable to think of Clinton without June, or without Albert, my mother and father. We are in 2013, and as I said, God, our mother, is still somehow challenging. The use of the whole set of language around family is still challenging to us because it's been distorted so vigorously and passionately by paternalism. Yeah. Now, the victims of paternalism are both men and women, as I say. We all have our aspirations and our possibilities restrained and perverted by this set of ideas that this is what human beings look like and this is the roles that they fit into. And really and truly, I'm not talking about roles. I'm talking about grades of human being. Grades of human being, you know? And by that notion, I suppose, if I was heterosexual, I'd be in the top grade of human being. I should feel proud, my goodness. Anglo-Saxon, <laughs> white, Protestant by birth. Well, kind of ish. <laughs> Thank God I was born gay. I would have been insufferable. <laughs> My goodness gracious me. Whew. That was a narrow escape you all 
had there, I can tell you. <laughs> now, you know, that picture which you have on your bulletins and which is also up on the screen of a pelican that looks like it's feeding its children, well, it's an ancient metaphor for Christ. An ancient metaphor for the Godhead. And it's called the pelican in her piety. It was the belief that pelicans, in times of great hunger and famine, um, in times of great famine and want, would pluck their own breasts until the blood flowed to feed their children on their own blood. This was the belief. It doesn't happen, alas. But metaphorically, I think it's something that happens with all of us. It's something that happened with God. That in our famine, God plucked God's breast. And we had the blood of Christ. Now I know that that's also uncomfortable language for some people from some faith traditions. But it's also liberational language for many others. For me, it was liberation. That concept of the blood of Christ when I was first coming to the faith was for me extraordinary because it was flesh, it was of the flesh, it was our salvation, not coming from some misty place, but from our fallenness, from humanity, from muscle and bone, from arteries and cartilage. But why I kind of think the story of the prodigal son is really about motherhood and the motherhood of God that all-covering love of God. And of course, we're all the prodigal son. We like to think, oh, it's a story about how forgiving God can be with people who have misbehaved themselves. No, it's a story about how God is with all of us. You know, we're all the prodigal son, that's a problem. Let's not get bogged down with the particular crimes that the elder brother, who I think we all recognize as well, the elder brother was seriously passive-aggressive, and a whole list of things which he wanted the father to have done from him, but we can assume he never asked the father. He just judged the father for not having been psychic and provided them. You know, that's a problem with many of our relationships and our relationships with our parents, isn't it? You should have done this. Why didn't you? Well, you didn't ask me to. You should have known. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen? So part of us is the elder son. Part of us is the thorn in the side, the, the, the nuisance, and part of us is the younger son who frittered away our inheritance on prostitutes. <laughs> but they both end up in the same place. Yes. And where they end up is in the loving arms of their mother, God. Mm -hmm. The dignified old man that drops everything and then goes careening across the fields to embrace his son, who had just come from running a pigsty and was half starved, so we can assume that he wasn't too pretty. <laughs> it's this idea that dignity, which is so much a figure of human lives, you know, whoo, it's beneath that dignity to do that, is something totally foreign to God. Dignity is also pretty foreign to new mothers. You know, you kind of lose your dignity to a large extent. You know, when you're, in, when you're changing diapers and breastfeeding and trying to find somewhere desperately to have a bit of privacy so that you can tend to your child, all that sort of business. It's not very dignified. And yet it has the most colossal dignity. Does that make sense? Yes. It's not dignified, but it has extraordinary dignity. That's pretty much a human condition. We're not very dignified, but we have great dignity. I'm going to say something I shouldn't now, um, but I think I've said it before, it's, it's one thing my mother always used to say when I was terrified of approaching figures of authority, paternalistic figures, hierarchical figures. My mother would just say, well, imagine them on the toilet. <laughs> yes, quite. We all need to be brought down a notch or two, you know, and show that we are all undignified fundamentally. So. This is particularly important with MCC. It's particularly important for us. This issue of being comfortable with the idea of God as father and mother. Yes. It's particularly important because 
MCC is not like other denominations in which it has a doctrinal position. It has, in many ways, the broadest doctrinal position that is um, uh, in line with what we might call Orthodox Christianity. So a whole bunch of different people from a lot of different positions can comfortably rest with an MCC. The difference with MCC is it says yes to them all to the point of them entering. It doesn't tell them what they must believe, but it allows them in and embraces them and asks them. <laughs> And therefore, because we are amongst people who have lots of different faith traditions, it is vitally important that MCC is able to be comfortable with that diversity and realize that we're not just making a niche for people who believe like me. Within this room, there are going to be people who believe wildly different Christian narratives. And unless we accept that there is dignity in that and that God is leading them, we're really going to be in a pickle because <coughs> We'll redivide ourselves. Do you know what I mean? We'll say, well, of course, they're in a horrible error. They're going to burn in hell. <laughs> well, you know, that's not actually that's not actually consistent with Christian belief to be able to be in a loving relationship with somebody and be content with the idea of them burning everlastingly in the fiery pits of hell. It's just not. <clears throat> it's not loving. <clears throat> If human beings who are so fallen can still love unconditionally at times and can still forgive all things, if mothers can forgive all things, and my goodness, they do on occasion, how much more the God from whom all things come? We may rest in confidence that this God is infinitely better than we are able to do in our broken society. So, when it comes down to language, and the language of the family of God, and the language of God the Father and God the Mother, it's all completely meaningless unless we ascribe all things to God. If we don't ascribe all things to God, all names, all glory, <laughs> then we are restricting God. If God is only God the Father, then we are telling God what God may be, and not the other way around. So I will close because I promised myself and other people that I wasn't going to preach a lot today because we have the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I want to say, to give us a little clue as to the change in language that we find when we approach the throne of God and how language is inadequate, is to tell a story about the building of St. Paul's Cathedral and how King James, when he turned up to look at the finished uh, cathedral, described it as awful and artificial. Now, we might assume that Sir Christopher Wren, who built the cathedral, would be appalled by it. But awful means it fills me with awe. And artificial means it is the extraordinary work of human hands. In just a few hundred years, the meaning of those two words has changed absolutely. So how much more must we be on our guard when we read the writings from 2,000 years ago or 400 years ago? <coughs> we must be patient. We must investigate, and we must dig deep. We must pray, because the words upon that page deserve it from us. Scripture deserves it from us. God is not just God the Father. God is God. In an extraordinary number of manifestations. In God's motherhood, in God's fatherhood, and of course, in brother and sister of us all, in Christ, God is intimate and loving and all forgiven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
to come to God's throne of grace in prayer is to lift up our hearts and our minds. Almighty God, we pray for those who would lead us and seek to lead us. We pray for the Church Universal throughout the world, for its leadership. We pray for Reverend Elder Nancy Wilson, our moderator. We pray for Reverend Elder Troy Perry, our founder. We pray for the College of Cardinals as they sit at Vatican City. We pray that grace and understanding and compassion and humility may rest upon all those who seek leadership. We pray for those who are our political leaders, for Barack Obama, the president, for leaders at state and local level. We pray for those who would support us in our lives here on earth, for the firefighters and the police officers, for those who tend to us and calm us and watch over us. We pray especially in our church community for those amongst us who are in sickness or suffering. We pray for the gift of healing which was given by Jesus Christ when on earth as a sign of his divinity. We pray for that healing upon our brothers and sisters, Jim and <coughs> Mac, Pat, David, for our friends elsewhere in the country who may be suffering and unwell. We pray for all those who are in recovery, especially in this valley where so many are touched and burdened by addiction. We pray for Reverend Andrew still grieving for the loss of his brother and mother. We pray for Scott Peterson, who will be having triple bypass surgery this week. We pray for all these. We lift them up because we love them. And we lift them up because we trust you and love you. We pray that you will surround them by compassion and affection, by expertise and wisdom, by comfort and kindness. We close by praying especially for those who have nobody to pray for them, for the hungry and the homeless, for all the million and a half refugees from Syria spread throughout the Middle East and beyond. We pray for those burdened still in parts of Africa and Asia. We pray for people suffering throughout the world. Almighty God, hear our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen.
saying, I give you peace, my peace I give you. So I say to all of you, peace be with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another the sign of God's peace. was divided by 70, but you know, it completely defeated me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I asked Reverend Kelly, I expect, well, okay. I'm used to asking anything I can't do myself, which is extraordinary. I'm used to putting it out there, and somebody miraculously comes forward, you can do it, you know. 45 and change. What was that? 45 and change. Well, there you go. I'm just saying, there you go. 45 and change, so, a mid-price meal for two, in other words, <laughs> from every person here, once a week. A mid-price meal for two, yep. and we have our budget. End of story. That's what it takes. And for that, the whole church runs. In yeah. fact, it runs well. We are to every detail in our budget. Um, so you know that some people in our congregation aren't going to be able to do the meal for two once a week. So if you can do a meal for four once a week, you know that you are covering those who can't. That's how Christian community works. <laughs> so instead of a meal for two, kind of mid-range meal for two, I'm kind of thinking, oh, I can really pull this man for What about desert turtle? Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, oh, Spencer's, yes, Spencer's, there's another one. But McDonald's. Uh, well, you know. You're not talking about getting coupons from them now. No, 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 I'm not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for a meal. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I put that out there. Because, you know, if we're mountaineers, and we are mountaineers in this church, and we all want to climb to the top of Mount Everest, you know? Yeah. If we don't start climbing, we won't get anywhere. We'll still be in the valley bottom. Just because we don't reach the top of Mount Everest doesn't mean we haven't failed. We've come a great deal more than we would have done if we'd never set out. <laughs> and the same with our stewardship. We cast our eyes on the mountain top, and we climb and we climb and we climb. And we discover that we have a beautiful view and can look down even if we haven't reached Mount Everest. <laughs> so, come please and give of your bounty. In Jesus' name. right and a good thing that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, yes. O oh God, for you welcome us to this table, wanting to be in relationship with us, and we come to this table to welcome you into our hearts and our lives. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we magnify your most glorious name, singing their never-ending hymn of praise. The saints.
You, O oh God, are the God of promise. Long ago, you promised that you would bless all people. And when the time is right, you sent us Jesus, who in words and deeds proclaimed your love for us, even to the point of emptying out his own life on a cross, a cross that was made by us and for us. For on the night when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was arrested, tried, and unjustly condemned, the same night that he was betrayed by his closest friends, he gathered with them in the upper room, an upper room chosen by a transgender, water-bearing man. He took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me always. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks and blessed it, he gave it to each one of them, saying, Take and drink. This is my promise to always be with you, my new covenant. Therefore, remembering your death and believing in your rising from the grave, we await the gift of yourselves. So now we pray, your Holy Spirit, upon these gifts, which you so freely give us, that they may be for us the true spiritual food and drink into life everlasting. Bless, dedicate, and concentrate these gifts as you bless, dedicate, and consecrate those gathered here for your use and purpose. For it is in your name that we pray the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ has risen. Christ, Christ will come again. The response of the people, the Agnes Day. Mm -hmm.